Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity once again that you've given us to just feast upon your word. I ask that you would filter out all of the ignorance, all of the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we've been studying together verse by verse in the epistle to the Romans, and in our last study together, we reached the end of chapter 15. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen ends the 15th chapter, and every one of God's children, without exception, has peace with God. Christ was delivered because of our offenses and he was raised again because of our justification, Romans 4, 25. The reason why Jesus Christ rose from the dead is because the sacrifice that he made on our behalf was sufficient. That's why he rose. That's what the text says. Had it not been sufficient, he could not have risen. Every Christian I know has always celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, but what the Christians today especially need to understand is that he could not have been raised. Jesus Christ could not have been raised from the dead unless what he did on our behalf was sufficient. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We are his seed. We have a common father. Christ Jesus became incarnate to be our kinsman redeemer and he paid the price for our sins so that we stand before God spotless and without blame. We have peace with God, Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, and some of the uh, newer translations tend to diminish the sovereignty of God by saying, therefore, having been justified by faith, let us have peace with God. But the context clearly says that something was done because of our offenses. It was the deliverance of the Lord Jesus Christ and because the price that he paid was sufficient, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead because of our justification, our being declared righteous. And so the, the fifth chapter begins, therefore having been declared righteous, we were made righteous through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Not personal faith in him, but because of the faithfulness in his obedience, of being delivered because of our offenses. We have peace with God. We have that. The only way that we can know the peace of God is to be firmly settled in the sovereignty of God. Something that, that is sorely lacking uh, within the world religious system as a whole that which I've often referred to as the, the world religious system based upon human merit. The only way that we can know the peace of God in an experiential sense is to be firm, you know, to know that which is true of us, that we have peace with God, is to be firmly settled in the sovereignty of God. And many of you have no doubt, you know, you've seen that, that that I do spend some time on the sovereignty of God. If God be not sovereign, then God is not God. Okay, if God is not sovereign, He can't do anything because your will is stronger than His. And I've, I've always found it just a little bit strange that the common evangelistic preaching is that God does not overrule man's will, and yet that same religious system asks Him to do just that. Not my will, but yours be done. 
we have peace with God. And so now we're moving into the 16th chapter. So uh, we kind of, it's like we've seen the movie here. Now it's, you know, roll the credits. And I think that the tendency is to, to either skip over the 16th chapter, kind of just breeze past it, not really taking a serious look at it. Because it's the end of the movie, and now we're just looking at the credits. And folks, I don't think that we can do that. As much as I'm anxious to get on, move on into our next series of studies, uh, Colossians is what we decided to, 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 to look at, take a serious look at, with probably some other intermittent uh, videos in between on various topics. But Colossians is a much shorter epistle, but a very important epistle. It's the, it's the epistle that this ministry has felt uh, that it's, I've felt led to go to move into Colossians. It's not that it's one of my favorite epistles. It's, uh, I, I tend to, to think twice about thinking that any epistle is any more important than any other. But just uh, if, in case you haven't uh, gotten word, the plan here is for Blessed Hope Forever is to move into the epistle to the Colossians. And I'm anxious to do that. But as anxious as I am to do that, I don't want to, to not do the 16th chapter of Romans justice. I don't want to get fail to give it the justice that it deserves, is what I'm trying to say. So we have peace with God, but the only way that we can know the peace of God that we have is to recognize the sovereignty of God. Jacob was God's child, and he also was made righteous because of the sufficiency of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But in his old age, he declared that everything was against him. You know, even God was against him. Not true. He had peace with God. But he didn't know the peace of God because he didn't rest in the sovereignty of God. There was Joseph who told his brother, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What they did was evil, but God meant it for good. Samson's parents did, didn't know that it was of the Lord. You know, when that tragedy hits you, that moment of distress, uh, loss of job, loss of loved one, loss of health, whatever it was, it was of the Lord. And to know the peace of God is to know a sovereign God who works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. Your security is not in, in your investments or in your activity or in your human strengths or in your job. Your security, you have it and it's in Christ. You have peace with God because of the faithfulness of Christ. We have peace with God. And we know that peace when we realize that He only touches us in love. To realize that every single event that comes into our lives has been filtered through the plan of the sovereign God. He knows the way that you take. He knows who you are. He's your Father. The fact that He's your Father your very first thought should be that He is the one who begat you. The one who occasioned your physical and your, your spiritual birth. What kind of a father uh, is He if He is not intimately concerned in my life and in everything that touches my life? You know, and I'm concerned as I travel around social media, uh, travel around my own uh, neck of the woods here, meeting Christians who cannot rejoice in the fact that they have peace with God when this is basic Bible doctrine 101. And oh, folks, I so want you to know this, that our Father is working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. If that is not true, then why bother with any of this? After He has tested us, after He has tested you, you will come forth as gold. There's no doubt about that. 
You know, and I've talked to pastors that have said, well, I'm no good as a pastor, and, you know, and I know that this church needs a, a, a much better pastor or a, a much younger pastor. You know, so, so now somehow the church has become not something that's ministered to by the Holy Spirit, but, you know, directed by, you know, the Pope. No, folks, we need to understand that we have peace with God, that God is working in us both the will and the do of His good pleasure, and that covers every minute aspect, every minute detail of our lives right down to the most seemingly insignificant. I praise God that you have the Holy Spirit. God said that He would lead you into all truth. You know, whether I make it clear or not. You know, I try to. But I don't have a corner on truth. But I have absolute peace that God touches my life in a way that He deems best. And more than that, I have absolute peace that He does that for you. If it were possible to write a book about the problems, the, the, the hardships, the, the difficulties, the sorrows, the horrors of just the few, the few lives who follow this channel, it would be staggering. There are difficulties and problems that, that many of us know nothing about. And, you know, we're considered the filth, the off-scouring of the world system. We're oppressed on every side, but not cast down. We're troubled on every side. There's a lot of sorrow. There's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering in this little group of people. Now, imagine what it is in the body of Christ. In this tiny fellowship, I don't want you complaining to God that you don't make enough money, that you're not happy enough, that you've got the wrong wife, the wrong husband, the wrong children, the wrong job, you know, that, that you're not handsome enough or pretty enough or whatever. Folks, why can't we rest in the fact that we have peace with God because our God is sovereign? If you don't have that rest and that peace, you haven't comprehended the power, the majesty, and the all-sufficiency of your God. He's not an idol that needs to be, you know, towed on little wheels, you know, that can't speak and can't move. He's the eternal, almighty God who spoke the worlds into existence. And we have the marvelous truth of His Word that in the presence of the Almighty and Eternal God, we stand wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. I believe that the burden of the Holy Spirit in the epistle to the Romans is all encompassed in the 33rd verse of this 15th chapter. The God of peace be with you all. And there are so many Christians that don't have much peace. Folks, you're not going to be here very long and you're going to find out that it was God who ordained your walk. I am absolutely convinced that when we stand before that throne of accounting, the accounting is not going to be based on, on little do's and don'ts, but how you comprehended the walk that God gave you and how that you built on Christ. Some of the greatest blessings in my life have been from what some people might call very simple Scripture. What a marvelous truth to know that my God is God, that everything that touches me went through His hand. Job fell and worshipped. That is what I want. I want it in my life, and I want it in yours. Rest entirely upon the power of our God. That was the introduction into the 16th chapter. And uh, 
And I, I'm going to avoid any arguments about whether it was part of the epistle to the Romans, whether it ought to be here, whether the epistle really ended at the end of the 15th chapter and, and somebody else wrote the 16th chapter. I believe the Holy Spirit is still the author, and now through Paul, the Holy Spirit says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is at Centuria. Phoebe was a pagan name. It means bright and moon. The, the poets, they called the moon Phoebe as they did the sun, Phoebus. The name is likely to, most likely was given her by her parents who were Gentiles. You know, and, and one would have thought that, well, maybe when she came to know the Lord, she would have changed her name, but she didn't. She rested in the Lord. The Lord had ordained that she had that name. Folks, I want to say that again. The Lord had ordained that she had that name. Bright Moon. And that, to me, is a, a light shining in the darkness. It's the light that rules over the darkness. And Paul says, I commend unto you Phoebe. The reason the chapter starts that way is because Phoebe has this letter tucked in her, in her purse. I just thought I'd make that up. And she's taking it to Rome. So when she gets to Rome, she has the epistle to the Romans to deliver to five, at least five, Roman churches. I assume five from what we glean from the 16th chapter. And I seriously doubt that Phoebe realized the enormous impact that this single task of service would have. Stop and think about that. Just something that you might want to think about. Especially uh, that the meaning of her name, given the fact that this was a dark period in, in the time of, of, of church history, of the church was being persecuted, the church was new, and God sends bright moon to deliver this letter to the Roman churches. It's interesting that the greetings at the end of the epistle begin with a woman who is a sister in the Lord. Why do I say that? Well, because early in the church, there were many responsibilities that were better taken care of by women than by men. Phoebe was a servant. The word servant there means a deaconess. She was one who served the church. Centuria was the easternmost part of Corinth. I believe it was a port city. Apparently where Phoebe lived and had met Paul when he was at Corinth. And, and some say, in fact most of the commentaries uh, will, will say that she was a wealthy businesswoman. And she has now agreed to carry this letter to Rome. She is being commended to those at Rome at a time in which in common society outside of the church, women were greatly demeaned which is, I believe, something else worthwhile to ponder. You know, I've had many people say to me over the years, you know, the great problem with the Bible is how it demeans women. You know, that the Bible demeans women and makes them less than human. And I've always said, well, okay, well, let's just pick some, some other religion under which you'd like to live. You know, Confucius, uh, Buddha, Muslim, Christianity has exalted women, and it's clear in the Word of God that there are some things women shouldn't do. They should not have continued authority over men, but I don't see that as a problem. I see that, actually see that as a blessing. God said the head of the woman is the man, the head of the man is Christ, 
and the head of Christ is God. I didn't set up that order. If you want to argue with God about it, be my guest. I won't. My God's not somebody that I argue with. I'm not going to say God may have made a mistake here and the order's wrong and I'd like to fix it. It was the women who ran first to the tomb. And they not only went, but the text says that they ran. It's the Holy Spirit who is commending Phoebe as the very first one at the, at the end of this epistle. Everything that was involved in your spiritual birth was involved in hers. I commend her, says the text, in order that you receive her in the Lord. Not just receive her, but receive her in the Lord. Christ loves Phoebe every bit as much as he loves any other member of his church. And many a student of the scriptures have tried to figure out, you know, well, you know, what did Phoebe do, you know, for Paul? Nobody has any idea. And I think that there's a reason for that. All too often we want to build on the on the work rather than on Christ. You know, it's just human curiosity. What did Phoebe do for Paul? You know, we really want to know that. What we really ought to know is that she's a faithful minister of Christ. I don't know what she did for Paul, but the Holy Spirit has given her a place of preeminence in the Word of God. My name's not there. You know, but God knows His own. He knows them by name. He knows you and I by name. And I have to believe that the Holy Spirit wanted to emphasize this fact at the closing of this epistle. And I want you to note that there's no mention of any of Phoebe's failures. There's no mention of any of the garbage in Phoebe's life. When, you know, when we both know that there had to be some there. That, I believe that's something else worth pondering. I commend the word commend there in the text. The word means her and Paul stood together. Okay? And I believe that to be in reference to the gospel. Well, I can see someone's calling me. And uh, so until next time, folks, I love you all. I truly do. We'll make it through Romans. Uh, we just don't want to rush over these verses. I thank you all for your continued prayers and your continued support. Uh, this is a, a, for all of you who are still watching and waiting for our Lord's return, there's a lot that could be said about uh, September, the two year anniversary of the sign. Uh, in fact, uh, I posted to Facebook recently how that the reading, the scriptural reading, uh, for Israel, according to their calendar, Torah calendar, uh, for the 23rd of September, which would be the two-year anniversary of the sign, is Nehemiah chapter 9, and I ask you to read Nehemiah chapter 9, and I want you to especially note the last three verses. And then, of course, September 11th is what we have always believed is the, the date of our Lord's birth. Once again, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.